Hello there! I have so much to say about Call Me By Your Name because I did like a month of research. And that month of research started because I was like, what the heck does Call Me By Your Name even mean? Like, where is that phrase from and what, what does that even mean? Which led me to a Reddit post, which led me to a Vox article, which led me to read Plato's Symposium, which led me to reading the whole book and rewatching the movie and making a video about shot composition. So I have a lot to say. I think a good thing to start off with is talking about the Vox article, beautifully written, sprinkled with all kinds of beautiful adjectives, and made you really want to go watch the movie. And if that was the point, then great job. However, they took a lot of liberties about inspiration for the book and like the point of it. But that article said that the phrase, call me by your name, they're like, at first, it doesn't quite make sense until you think of Plato's Symposium, in which one philosopher denoted that way back in the day, man was two beings in one. It had two faces and four arms and four legs. And then these beings became too powerful and so Zeus decided to split them apart. And so that's where like the idea of like soulmates comes in because it's like you're searching for your other half that makes you stronger because like you're in love and, and you're actually part of like this one being. And so they theorized that call me by your name meant because you have the same name, because you're the same being, because you're soulmates, which is very cute. And it may have, you know, been inspired by that a bit because the book does nod to Plato's Symposium, but that's not what the author said was why he said that. He, and this is real, he said the phrase, call me by your name, came to him because he had two friends who were lesbians and they had the same name. And so he wondered, is there a point in which they just call each other their own name? And how sweet is that? And I feel like if the author based the phrase off of the symposium, he would have said that first. But hey, that's just a hunch. You know what? I'm not mad that I got to read Plato's Symposium. It really opened my eyes. It made me feel like really inspired to read again. You know, that's its own gift. So I'm not mad that I got to read it. If you haven't read Plato's Symposium, you might as well. It's only like 74 pages long and there's lots of free translations you can read if you just Google Plato, Plato if you just Google Plato's Symposium. So I go, I, bleh, I do suggest you go read it. But if you don't want to go read it or if you haven't read it, this is what it's about. Socrates and a bunch of his friends all get together and they decide to talk about Eros, the god of love. And Eros is typically like known as like sexual love, like romantic love, like between romantic lovers. However, most of their stories have really nothing to do with that. You could kind of interpret some of them as that, but some translations say like, no, no, when they say lovers, they just mean mentor and student. They don't actually mean like physical lovers, which I mean, like maybe they should have said that then. Because there's part at the end where one of the guys was like, Socrates won't date me, and that sucks. And you, Socrates' boyfriend right now, he's going to leave you like he left me. And I'm sad about it. <laughs> That's kind of what it says. It's a hoot. Um, where were they going with that? <laughs> but anyway, so the, the symposium is just a bunch of Socrates' friends all giving praise to the god of love. So like every different facet of what love can be. So like being stronger in war because you're fighting for your lover. You know, the two halves of a whole person thing where it's like uh, love is so strong that if you're with your other half, then you're as strong as the gods. And so the gods didn't like that. And then Socrates has a, por a portion about meeting with a woman who tells him that Eros is not a god because it is not all good and all knowing. It is like it fluctuates and it's both good and bad and it's both yearning for something and is something. And it's very interesting. It's actually very easy to understand despite it being so 
dense because I feel like it's just like, yeah, that's how love is, huh? You know, and you just kind of know. Philosophy is fun that way. A big part of the book that is in the movie, but it's, it's, it's not as focused on, is Elio feeling completely known and wanting to be completely known and accepted. And how he felt at first separate from Oliver. He felt like Oliver was too brash and loud and confident. And he's like, I'm not, I'm not confident. I'll never be confident. And also, I don't really like how brash he is. But as he like goes along in the book, he discovers like, do I want to be him or do I want to be with him? And are those the same thing? <laughs> so Oliver stays in Elio's room for the summer. And so it's like, it's his, it's Elio's room. And, but it's Oliver's room. It's their room. Can I bring your things up to your room? Uh, sure, yeah. My room? <laughs> Follow him. You're very welcome here. See, si. our home is your home. It's cute. Elio likes this idea of like their lives pretty much melding together, like wearing each other's clothes and and calling each other by their own names. So it has that element of like meshing into one being, but it's more in the sense of being completely free and being yourself and being seen. And Elio talks a lot about how it feels like Oliver can like read his mind and like he can understand what he's getting at without having to say it. And he's like, I've never felt that way before about anybody. It is like about like pure love in that sense. And so I do understand the tie in to Plato's Symposium. And I definitely think that it supplements it. And since the author did reference it in the book, I'm sure that it was a big influence along with lots of philosophy and lots of classic literature. So like, I'm not saying like, oh, they're completely unrelated, but that is, <laughs> that's not literally where the phrase comes from. <laughs> I'm not even sure if I would say that it's necessarily like a soulmate thing, I guess maybe, but but in the book, the author doesn't really denote that that means anything. <laughs> you know, like that that means like that you're meant to be together because Oliver and Elio are only together in the book for like two weeks and then Oliver leaves and then he goes and gets married to somebody else and has a whole life without him. And then they just kind of meet every, 10 years or so and they're like that summer was great and I still like you buddy and nothing romantic happens again so it's mostly a story of like like a whirlwind summer of like real true connection and like showing Elio that like you can be fully accepted and fully seen and being yourself is really cool and is really fulfilling and amazing and possible instead of it being like and then they get married and happily ever after the end <laughs> you know they don't get married some would argue like oh well this was supposed to be an ideal love story because there's a sequel but the sequel was written in 2019 after the movie came out and the author didn't have ever intend to write a sequel and then just people kept like wondering what happens next and so he's like okay sure i'll write more about it and then the sequel called find me is also about elio's dad and how he became like wise in the way of love i didn't read the sequel but i mean like there's a whole big speech that elio's dad gives at the end about like feeling your feelings and not letting them go just because you're you like don't numb yourself from all feeling just because you don't want to feel bad feel everything feel the good stuff and the heartbreak because otherwise you'll just go numb and lifeless by the time you're 30. and so find me is like how did elio's dad learn that at least this is what the author says <laughs> it's also 
Elio and Oliver when they're like way older. And I don't know how that ends. I guess like, I mean, they reconnect, but they've reconnected a couple times in the book already and nothing really happened, but you know, I don't know. But the author didn't say like, this is a sequel. He's just like, this is what happens later and like more story. I don't know why he doesn't want to call it a sequel, but he doesn't. Again, not really the point of the book to say that they're destined to be together or something. His inspiration to write the book was about nostalgia and remembering like young love and like returning to places he used to be as a kid where he like kissed somebody on a corner and now always he'll remember that he kissed that person and he like is wondering like what would happen if I ended up with her versus somebody else and like he's like I'm glad that I didn't but like what if? And also just that feeling of that still lives there, that still lives in him. That's still like a very pleasant memory, even though when you're older, things don't work out the way you thought they would. <laughs> like, Gauza. It is, it's such a pleasant story. And by the end, it's just discussing like, Elio wants to know that Oliver still has that connection with him. And it's just very touching, that kind of pure, like a frozen moment of love that's like unsullied because it only lasted two weeks when you were young and bright and excited and you had your whole life ahead of you and so many possibilities and everything. I know that like the book or the whole story is controversial because of the age gap because Elio is supposed to be 17 and Oliver is supposed to be 24 and in the movie Elio is played by a 20 year old and Oliver is played by a 28 year old and so then the age gap looks it's it's kind of comparable but it's like it looks drastic and in real life it would be drastic but I feel tricky saying about this because people who have had that happen where like if you're 17 years old and a 24 year old wants to date you, they do not most of the time have pure intentions because if you're a full grown adult, you don't want to be dating a child. <laughs> well, a 17 year old, you don't want to be dating someone that much younger than you because they're still developing their brain and they're still like immature and like if you only like them because they're so bright eyed then then that's kind of a red flag because it's like well why don't there's bright eyed people your own age you know so like in real life that would be a really sus situation and in the movie seeing it actually play out it does look shady because it's like that elio looks really young and you can tell that oliver is a grown man. <laughs> so like that element of it is very uncomfortable and very off-putting. <laughs> but then like in the book, I'm not making excuses for that in real life, it wouldn't work out. But in the book, it is just this like fantasy situation where a smart, handsome man moves into your house for the summer and you fall in love and he stays in your room and he, he likes you a lot. <laughs> and then they date for two weeks and it's magical and then they never see each other again. Well, they see each other again, but like far, far in the future. So like, it's not this, this story saying that like, and then everything worked out and then uh, their lives went together perfectly. Like, no, Oliver left to go get married their lives are not the same. It doesn't mean that things are going to work out just because they get along really well, you know? It's just like a different situation. But also, in the book, Oliver is not like a real life kind of like manipulative guy. He's not the best guy, but I mean like he's not really like the real life 24 year old that this would happen in real life. Um, that sounded not in that. He's, he's not like super realistic he's like this idealized kind of guy he's like he's there to be like big and confident and smart handsome guy american guy who can open your eyes to the world and it's from elio's perspective of seeing this handsome man it's not from 
and and Oliver is hesitant and Oliver is shy and Oliver is genuine <laughs> he's not shady and that's not realistic like one I don't think it's appropriate to date the son of the professor you're working for for the summer I don't think that's uh that's appropriate if you're moving into somebody's house you probably shouldn't date their son I don't know and also if you're older you probably shouldn't date their son you should have that discernment but in this fantasy world the parents are like great this is great Oliver so nice I like him a lot and then Elia's like me too and Oliver's like you guys are great everything's great everything's great whereas in real life you'd be like why aren't the parents not allowing this in real life you'd be like why is that 24 year old want to date this child when he has so many friends and so many connections and so many whatever what's wrong with him and in the book really nothing's wrong with him and that's not to say that like people like oliver don't completely exist like there are like confident smart people who uh who mean well but uh those confident smart people who mean well would also know that a 17 year old is not developed enough to understand the implications of dating somebody. The book is also this fantastical land where cheating doesn't really matter and relationships are pretty much just the present moment and don't matter in an hour from now kind of thing because Elio has a girlfriend in a sense like they're kind of like friends with benefits slash a girlfriend when convenient. <laughs> <laughs> and so when he dates Oliver, it's kind of like Marcia's just like, all right, uh, call me next week then, whatever. And it's like, well, that's also not really common. I mean, it could be maybe some places, but normally it's not like that kind of vibe. Like somebody, like commitment exists and people get hurt and all kinds of stuff, but that just doesn't really happen in the book like Elio it's Elio's little fantasy about like oh I can date whoever I want all the time and it's great <laughs> and it is in the book it is great he's having a swell time and everybody's happy and everybody's welcoming and lovely so that's why I kind of feel like the controversy of it not that people who think it's controversial are wrong because in real life yeah of course but and maybe maybe the notion that Oliver is actually a very nice guy and does nothing wrong in the book is misguided and would mislead people to thinking that it's okay to date somebody who's seven years older than you when you're 17. But I don't know if, the, I don't know. It is tricky because it's like, that is not really the point of the book. The book isn't to say that like everything will work out and everything's great. It's like this land where everybody's kind and welcoming and lovely. And that's why everything works out, but they don't end up together because <laughs> that's not the point. <laughs> the book is also this retrospective nostalgia. The whole narrative is written kind of like circularly. Like the just the beginning chapter is a great example of like, did I fall in love with Oliver when he first came to the house? Or maybe it was this other time two weeks into the visit. Or maybe it was this other time, whatever. And that's like, each paragraph in the first couple pages. What if this was when it happened? What if this was when it happened? So it's not like a straightforward narrative all the time. It like flips back and forth between like linear storytelling versus contemplating because it is Elio's stream of consciousness. It's seeing what's happening and thinking about what happened in the past and theor theorizing what's gonna happen in the future like all at the same time. And the inspiration from the book was also a retrospective because Andre Ackerman is much older. He's not like a, he's not in his 20s. He was like in his 40s or something when he wrote the book. So it's all about like remembering young love, remembering when he was on vacation as a little kid and thinking about like, what if I was in love with that boy on vacation and what would have happened if we were in love. <laughs> it's very interestingly written and it, it really just tugs you right along because it's just like, and then, and then, and then, and then what if this, what if I'm a bad person? What if I'm a good person? What if Oliver actually hates me? What if I'm making this all up and he actually doesn't really like me at all and he's not thinking about me? What if that one notion that, uh, what if that, uh, that little comment he made, what, what if that means that he's actually in love with me? What if I'm stupid and that's not true at all? <laughs> 
And it's so, it's fun hopping back and forth between those things. That all to say, I don't think that the book is for everybody. I think that sometimes, because it's the mind of a 17 year old who wants to um, uh, get with literally everybody he sees, sometimes there's some really weird stuff in it. <laughs> and that weird stuff is a bit off-putting, like the peach scene. The peach scene is three pages that I wish I hadn't read. <laughs> I'll get into that more in the next video. But um, being in somebody's stream of consciousness, it makes you really empathetic for the person. It makes you really see like, like this narrator is not quite sure what's going on. He's, he's going through like every possible situation of what could be happening and piecing together if Oliver likes him or not throughout the book. Well, until like halfway through <laughs> when he knows that he does. <laughs> and that just makes you, you know, you're entering Elio's world, which makes it so sweet how in the movie it has so much piano music so that you're constantly in Elio's world and like the focus is on him. With the kind of structure that the book has that could be difficult to um, translate into film. And I think they did a great job because the constant wheels turning is mostly just like sitting around and thinking and witnessing the summer, witnessing your life, witnessing like the interactions between people. And I think that the movie captured that by, you know, doing so many shots and they do little nods to the book throughout the movie which like gives it like this summery feel. There's like a part where they show the passing of time through showing the bathing suits, different color bathing suits hanging in the bathtub. And that's like a nod to the book because there's like a whole bit where Elio is like, Oliver wears this swimsuit when he's, when he's grumpy. I'm allowed to talk to Oliver when he's wearing a blue bathing suit because he's in a better mood. And like, he's like theorizing like, Oh, like trying to make connections without just talking to him. <laughs> He's like trying to like make connections between like his outfits and like his mood. And then they kind of nod to that by showing like the different bathing suits, how like Oliver's always wearing a different one, which is so fun. And then they also have little in between establishing shots of an apricot tree, apricot, whatever, tree. That's a whole section of the book too about like watching Oliver pick apricots. They don't even talk about that in the movie really they show you they show the tree so it's a little nod for the viewer but it also by showing the tree pauses the audience and is like giving you this summery feel of just like noticing things and like being in this like beautiful land and having like a just a great summer <laughs> I guess overall I'm just saying like I don't really have an overall I guess the book is great <laughs> And the movie did a great job interpreting it. I might suggest reading the book, but it's got some crazy stuff in there. So like, I don't know if I would like super recommend reading the book, but it is, I would recommend listening to the audiobook. Army Hammer reads it and that's his own thing. So like, I don't know, it, make, of, make of that what you will. But he reads it super, it's super like, I would turn it on to listen to like for a little while and then like an hour would pass by and I'd be like, whoa, where'd time go? You know, like it's so wow. And it's how it's written, but it's also how it reads it. It's great. And you can listen to it free on YouTube or at least half of it. So um, go for it. It's great. I mean, I, it was great. Best audio book I've ever heard. I'll see you next time for more Call Me By Your Name fun facts and weird moments. Goodbye.